But that is the why behind this. And so when you start looking at the why of, what, of your ambition and what you're after, the why behind it is whatever it is for you. If you ask anybody in this room, what's your definition of success, we would all have a different story and a different way of saying that. That may be monetary, it may be relational, there's a variety of different things we have to balance when we're juggling. Now, I love the bell curve. Somebody showed me this as a financial advisor, I'm like, ah, boring, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, <clears throat> but what I started to really kind of realize is this showing up as a mechanism in our lives here too. So, everybody knows Pareto's principle, 1776, whatever, 80 20 rule. Everybody's heard that a million times, right? What we're starting to see is a shift in the marketplace <clears throat> where it maybe is the 90 10 rule. So, 10% of the people are doing 90% of the business. You know, I'm starting to see this on the TV a bunch of like, oh, the wicked top 1% rich guys, we need to take all their money. You know, because the 1% make more money than the other 99% combined. So everybody wants to take their money, and these are the guys that took the risk and did the different things that they did to produce that. Now, there's a political conversation that can come out of that, but fundamentally it flies in the face of capitalism in my assessment. However, where I kind of go, this is very useful to look at customer breakdown. Some will, some won't, so what? Everybody hears that over and over again, okay? so like. There are certain people, if they come to me and they're shopping really hard for a mortgage, they're going, well, I'm on the internet and I'm talking to 10 different people and the best rate I'm seeing out there, da 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 I'm like, oh, <clears throat> like, yeah, I get it. Now, do they really, like, is that their most important thing? Maybe they're down here because it's more like the 1486% rule when you get in that. My offer is probably not relevant for them because I'm not the Walmart of the mortgage business. Okay, I'm going to strive to be the Ritz Carlton or Nordstrom or something much better than that. I'm not going to like rip people off on the other end of it, but I also want to make sure that I have a team, I have lights, I have rent, I have copiers, I got all this different infrastructure that we need to cover, and there's a fundamental mechanism behind that that has to be taken care of. So. When people want to push too hard, I don't do that. This big section in the middle is about 68%. This is where most of the people lie. This is where most of the offers are made. Now, people, through your narratives, will either move towards your way of thinking or not. Okay? So, where I kind of go with this is hold this space of, a, um, of the bell curve and how that shows up in your business because if... 98% of the time it goes this way, don't worry about the 2%. It happens every now and then. Every now and then, something weird happens. You can't plan around it. So you want to focus on the stuff that you can plan around, which is the 98%. Okay, now fundamentally, well, let's talk about selling. Selling is one of the domains of concerns for a business. Okay, sales. I say that all of us are in the sales business. Okay, we're selling our services, we're trying to generate revenue for our business if we are in business. Now, the ceiling of profitability is based on revenue. So, for example, it sounds really simple, okay, but let's just look at it. Okay, okay here's the revenue, here's the cost, okay. And then where you, where you start looking at is the difference between whatever the revenue that comes in is the cost, that's called profit. Okay? People don't hold that because they spend money and don't think about what's profit. Profit means I gotta have revenue. That starts with sales. And where I say is you don't have to spend a lot of money in to be good at sales. It's a skill that you learn like everything else. <clears throat> so four parts of the sale, initial contact, we're gonna talk a little bit about that here which is like the initial contact where you contact people and you're actually out in the marketplace connecting with people and telling them about your sales <clears throat> or what you do, your offerings basically. Building rapport, this is pretty good. <clears throat> we're usually pretty good at that if we're good at sales. One of the things I would say is like, I met this lady yesterday, really tough customer, I never met her, and so Scotty got me in front of her, she's like, I just want to tell you that I've been doing business with this guy for 12 years and she was like really, is tough so I kept working it and working it asking questions and shutting up and listening that's an interesting thing and then I unveiled that she grew up in Houston and uh, oh wow well, it was some common ground I grew up in Houston her husband's a photographer like oh I'm a photographer oh yeah yeah but I was like wow and 45 minutes later we built this tremendous rapport I don't know that there was an opening for an offering there necessarily but where that's a skill that we're usually pretty good at 
The next piece of it is closing. Closing is not about closing a deal necessarily. Closing is about what you want to happen next in the situation. Okay, so the next thing I want to happen is this, then I have to do that. Okay, great. So if somebody says, I don't want to do that, then I didn't close them. I either I did or I didn't. That's the reality of the situation. Now when you get paid, that's a real closing. Closest to the money stuff that Scott talks about. I love that. And then follow-up typically is something that we don't spend a lot of time in because it's a tedious task. It can actually be delegated on a certain level. And there's some systems out there that are really good for follow-up or using auto-drip campaigns or some different stuff like that. But what I'm talking about is fundamentally in the space of sales. Sales start with leads. Okay, everybody has a different, uh, uh, a different definition of what leads are. Okay, lead for me is anybody that I have their name, have some way to be proactive and contact them, and I have some mechanism or some, some need that I have discerned that they have that they may need my services. Okay. Now, why are leads important? They're at the beginning of the process and you're in control of it. Now, Ken and I have been talking about this, but this gets down to a, and where I would go fundamentally is looking at metrics of the number of people that you have to talk to. In the real estate game, that looks more like this is an initial lead, came in from the internet, came in from a friend or referral, whatever it is. And then there would be some type of agreement that we would make. Now that could look like a buyer's rep agreement, that could look like a listing agreement, that could look like some sort of something that we agree that we're doing something or moving to the next step. For me, that could be somebody goes online and they make a loan application. They've agreed to go to the next step and absorb a little bit of cost. Okay, the third thing is obviously the closing and the closing metrics and the ratios of that. Now, one of the things that I would say when it talks about lead generation we use a lot of different systems around here. One of them is consistematic business communication. My friend Kelly came up with that. It means consistent and systematic. And I think it's a really brilliant thing because most of us are not consistent and most of us don't have a system associated with it. Okay, we're haphazard because what happens is when we don't have any sales, Okay, what we do is we go out and market and sell, 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 then we get a pipeline of stuff and then we don't have time to market so it goes down like that. Now, business cycles are happening inside of this dynamic, so the idea is that if there is some other thing that's out there that you can use, that you can outsource even, which is consistematic business communication, it looks more like that. So when business cycles happen, they're more like this, okay, which is a much better place than to be down here, okay. But you got to set it up. You got to absorb the cost on the front end to do it. Now it allows you to connect with others, which enriches your relationship in a powerful way. I'm a big face-to-face, -face, on the phone person. That's what I do. That's my God-given gift, and that's what I love to do, and it excites me. Believe me. When somebody tells me I pissed them off and they went and did something different and they invented a really cool offer, I'm like, oh, sweet, that's pretty cool, I like that. Now, it builds a business relationship, so when you have relationships that are business but you don't do business and it doesn't produce revenue, that's called a friendship. Okay, everybody be real clear on that, okay? It's not a business relationship, okay? Now, we love to lie to ourselves, the animals that we are, and say that it's a business relationship, but it's not. Only if it produces something. Hi, how are you? Come on in. It builds your expert identity. <clears throat> expert identity is a really interesting thing. So, expert identity is like your currency in the marketplace. What did, uh, was it, is it the guy that was it, Tom Winnick, and I forgot what he, is it Tom Winnick? Is that his name? Or? I can't remember, but he's talking about currencies in the marketplace, but for me, it's your identity, which is your reputation of what people say about you and whether or not you act trustworthy. Part of the way that you act is either consistent or it's not. Trust is a whole other conversation, but your expert identity can be built just like compound interest. It shows up just like that. And every month or every periodic, whatever time it is for you, when it shows up, it shows up and compounds upon itself. 
So if you do what you say you're going to do and you keep your promises and hold your commitments, somebody can make an assessment that you hold your commitments. If you do that recurrently, then that's called being trustworthy. If you show up on time, a lot of people don't show up on time. I get that. They have other different things that they do. So like time, it makes my skin crawl when I'm two minutes late for a meeting. I used to just like, who cares? And then, uh, let, me, let me absorb their cost while they're waiting while I'm a selfish jerk and I show up late. No. That, not that, okay, because you move in a different way when you show up on time. That's just kind of a different ethic, and, and not good or bad. It is what it is. Just be aware, okay? So it helps you create and build your inner circle is the other thing here. Now, what we use is a form called the 55525. The thing I like about this, and I made some copies for some people. If you guys want one, just let me know. What I like about this is this is a form that says, okay, well, let me define it first. So, a five, the first thing would be like, you met a new person this week. You need to meet five new people a week. How would you do that? Well, you'd have to actually be out in the marketplace. You'd have to get a new lead coming. You'd have to have, be connected to somebody. In some way, it would have to happen. And if you didn't do that, then you didn't do it. It's really black and white. Did you do it or not? Okay? The second thing is, a handwritten note. The power of a handwritten note is huge. I'm starting to see more of this happen in the marketplace, but it goes under the radar, the gatekeeper, all those kind of different things. If you're trying to get to the HR director or some big wig and you send them a personal note or you met them or whatever, it's one other touch point. It's really powerful. People underestimate the power of it. The next thing is five phone calls a day, outbound. Not, do you know or do you know somebody needs to buy or sell real estate? Do you know somebody needs a web design? You know, you know like, that's blatant sales. So where I kind of go is what my teacher Rick teaches me, which is some old school stuff, Ford, family, occupation, recreation, dreams. It's not rocket science. Hey, so how's the grandchild doing? Huh. So how's it going at work? Uh, hey, where are you guys going on vacation this year? Uh, what do you do for fun? You know, da, 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 you're asking the questions and you shut up and listen, you're practicing your listening skills. And then dreams are like, what's your big dream? What's your ambition? What do you want to do? What do you want out of life? What's important to you? All those different types of things. Those are the conversations that deepen the trust. So authenticity is the portal to trust. So the more authentic you are and the more that you do that and the more, the more real person you are, there's a certain number of people that you can have relationships with. So the other five very important in the hierarchy of things is a face-to-face -face engagement, okay? Now, if you can hold this practice, I hold a different one, it's called Greatness Track, which is like this on steroids, but if you can hold this practice, five face-to-face -face meetings, five handwritten notes, 25 outbound phone calls a week, and meet new five, five new people a week, and actually put them into your database, your sphere of influence, this will grow your business minimally by 20 to 30 percent year over year. I can grab it over and over again for years and years and years in here. So, so simple and it's so low cost. Like it doesn't cost you anything but a few hours a week of your time when it really gets down to it. So, I would tell you to do that. Now we're going to go through a little exercise here. Let's take just a moment. <coughs>